Today, as we come to the table, confess your sin, you have to repent of it, and you have to receive Jesus as Lord. That's all that you need to do to be saved. It's simple to be saved. Confess, repent, and receive Christ as your Savior. The Bible says you are saved. But we see in the scripture that to be a disciple, there's another step you have to take. To be a disciple, you have to totally set yourself apart from the things of God. And drawing near to God is the same thing. And I've always prayed this verse, as I said, every day for years, Lord, draw me near to you and draw near to me. But the rest of the verse, I didn't really pay that much attention to because the rest of the verse says this, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And what does he mean by that? That is live righteously and stop living like the world. Becoming a Christian is easy, living as a Christian isn't. But it's worth the work. It's worth taking yourself out of sin and living for Jesus. It's worth seeking Jesus' love and grace and filling your life with Him. Well, thanks for taking the time to join us as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Mark Kirk, Senior Pastor of Calvary Knoxville. Pastor Mark will be telling you today about an encounter between Moses and God. Moses is ready for ministry, but he needs to be near his Creator in order for it to be successful. The same is true for you. You need to draw near to God as you step out in faith. And this isn't a one-time thing either. It's a daily decision to be close to your Savior and discover exactly what He has planned for you. Now, open your Bible to Exodus chapter 3 as Pastor Mark begins his message, Drawing Near to God. If you have your Bibles, let's open them up to Exodus chapter 3. Before we get into Exodus, we'll be doing verses 1 through 6. But before we read that, just again to encourage you guys, I know that Whenever these events happen, like the very unusual earthquake in Colorado and then the very unusual earthquake in Washington, you know, God says again in the last days, He's going to be shaking. Everything that can be will be shaken, and the things that can't be shaken will remain, and that's our walk with the Lord. That's our rock. So the world may be shaken by these things, but we as believers should not be shaken. God's in control, and God even says He'll use these shakings to bring the nations to Him. So When these kind of things happen, God will use them to bring people to Him, and we're in for a lot more shaking, I believe, as we get closer to um, the Lord's return. So don't let these things shake you up. Not trying to make a pun there. There's going to be a lot of literal shaking, but don't let it shake you up. Guys, remember, the Lord is our rock. He's our foundation. This world never has been stable. There's nothing stable but the Lord in our life. He's what's going to keep us stable. He'll keep us stable until He comes back and gets us, and then... Keep us stable forever and eternity. So let's just be able to pray that God helps us to be a witness and and to share the Lord. These are exciting days we live in. They're sad days, but they're exciting days. So just want to encourage you not to be shaken by this stuff because quite literally there's going to be more shaking coming up, I believe. You know, I, I kind of wonder if maybe it's not going to be an earthquake in our area. You know, they don't, it's interesting. They don't even have a fault line up there in that area where the earthquake happened yesterday. We do have a fault line here in our area probably do for a little bit of shaking our, our end as well. So if God chooses to shake us, then um, all it's going to do is draw us closer to Him. Amen? Praise the Lord. Let's just pray for God to use it, guys. I mean, the worst thing that happened to us is we suddenly find ourselves in the kingdom. That's not so bad, is it? Exodus chapter 3, verse 1 says, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, the father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of the bush. So he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. And then Moses said, I will now turn aside to see this great sight why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. And he said to him, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Last week, as you know, we made it up to verse 
Well, up through verses 2, uh, 1 and 2, we finished 23, the last part of chapter 2, and then we got up to verses 1 and 2 in chapter 3, and we weren't able to finish the last part, but I'm kind of glad it broke off that way because this whole last section here, verses 3 through 6, there's a powerful message in this of drawing near to God, and something God even again was showing me in this passage that I've never seen before, which is always exciting. You know, you can read the Bible over and over and over numerous times. Some of you guys have been through the Bible numerous times as you've been walking with the Lord for a lot of years, and God will show you something brand new each time you go through, and new things in every passage. And I love it because you can't exhaust God's Word. It is deeper than we can ever go. And the exciting thing to me, the Bible says even in heaven, we won't be able to exhaust God's greatness and His power and His Word. That's exciting to me. And tonight we see God drawing Moses into Himself. Now Moses no doubt knew the Lord. He was a believer. He knew God. But God wanted a deeper relationship with Moses. And in order to get that deeper relationship in Moses' life, he had to do some things in Moses first. Take him through some desert times. Help him die to himself. Help him not to depend on Moses, but depend on God. Not to look toward what the world provided as far as the education that he got at uh, Harvard of Egypt or whatever. And all these things, being a child of, of Pharaoh, a stepchild of Pharaoh and adopted by Pharaoh's daughter, he would have had all this training. We talked about that already. And God, there's nothing wrong in all that. That was great. God can use that. God can still use us if we have an education. Understand that. He can still use us even if we have an education. But he has to then let us lay that aside to depend on the Spirit of God to do the work. I'll never forget the story I read about Charles Spurgeon where he wanted to go, he was young, a teenager, and he wanted to go to seminary and get a seminary degree in Bible college. That's what everybody did in that day, and that's a good thing. And he said God spoke to him when he was in the uh, dean's office waiting to register and to talk to the dean. God spoke to his heart and said, Charles, I want you to get up and leave. I've not called you to do this. And he couldn't understand why. And he he said he was just, is this really God's voice? Why would God tell me not to go to Bible college? And he said, the reason I don't want you to go, he said, God spoke to his heart and answered him. And he said, the reason I don't want you to do this is because I'm going to use you in great ways. And when I do, I don't want this Bible college to get the credit. I want the credit. This is me working. This is not Charles Spurgeon and it's not so-and-so university. Moses needed to learn that. So it's not that that was bad of Moses to have that training. I'm sure God used that. I mean, God uses everything. But now Moses had been emptied of everything he depended on in the world, all the things that could have happened. And God says, now Moses, you're ready. Now I'm going to draw you to me and I'm going to light you aflame. The way that this burning bush is on fire, I'm going to light your heart on fire and I'm going to draw you to me. You know, the Bible says in James 4, 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. I pray that prayer almost every morning. I say, Lord, you know, I give my life to you today and I ask that you would draw me to you and you would draw near to me. And I didn't really understand the full import of that verse until last week. But I've been praying it for years. And again, drawing near to God, it's indeed true if we draw near to God that he will draw near to us. But what does it really mean to draw near to God? Does drawing near to God just mean doing more Bible study? Does it mean praying more? Does it mean seeking him more? Because if that could be the answer, I would have done that when I was a baby Christian. Because I made up my mind as a baby Christian, I was going to seek God like all, just almost around the clock. I was going to get up at four in the morning, pray for hours, be this many hours in the Word, and I had this whole regiment down. That's my personality. And that lasted for a little while. I don't think the four o'clock ever even happened, but getting up earlier than normal happened for a little while. And I'm not saying that God hasn't developed a regular regiment of spending time with Him in the Word, but God took me through a series of, of allowing me to exhaust myself in trying to somehow get near to Him by what I could do to get near to Him. How long I could spend in the Word. How long I could pray. And I, and I begin to realize that's not what it's about. It's a relationship. It's just something that happens. It's, a, it's an extension of the relationship. That's where the time of the Word comes in. That's where the time in prayer comes in. And yes, it's important to be disciplined. If you're not disciplined in those areas, you know, you may have to start out by setting boundaries on yourself so you start getting in the Word and getting in prayer. But simply reading the Bible more and praying more and seeking Him more does not draw you near to God. It doesn't do it. But are there any requirements to draw near to God? That's interesting because, as a matter of fact, the Bible says there are some requirements if we're going to draw near to God. You see, there are no requirements to salvation other than you have to confess your sin, you have to repent of it, and you have to receive Jesus as Lord. That's all that you need to do to be saved. It's simple to be saved. Confess, repent, and receive Christ as your Savior. The Bible says you are saved. But we see in the Scripture that to be a disciple, there's another step you have to take. To be a disciple, you have to totally set yourself apart from the things of God. And drawing near to God is the same thing. And I've always prayed this verse, as I said, every day for years, Lord, draw me near to you and draw near to me. But the rest of the verse, I didn't really pay that much attention to because the rest of the verse says this, cleanse your hands, you sinners, 
and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And what does he mean by that? That is live righteously and stop living like the world. And what he's saying is, if you want to draw near to me and you want me to draw near to you, you've got to set the world aside. Now, we live in the world, I understand that, and we've been given all things richly to enjoy, right? So whatever's not sin, we can just have a blast at. That's not what he's saying. But he's saying, don't live like the world. Don't live in sin with the rest of the world. Don't go along in sin with the rest of the world. If you want to draw near to me and you want me to draw near to you, then you've got to cleanse your hands. You've got to purify your hearts. What does the scripture say? Who may ascend to the hill of the Lord? He who has a clean hands and a pure heart. That's who may ascend. So you want to go higher in the things of God? You need to have clean hands and a pure heart. It's not a requirement for salvation, but it is a requirement for intimacy, for closeness with the Lord. You can be married to your spouse, but you're not going to be intimate with your spouse unless you choose to be and do the steps that are needed to be intimate with your spouse, right? The same thing is true with the Lord. He's our heavenly spouse. If we want to draw close, I mean, he's available to everybody. God is available for everybody to draw close, but only those who truly say, all right, Lord, I'm going to cleanse my hands. I'm going to purify my heart. I'm going to turn away from the things of the world. I live in the world, but I'm not going to be of the world. I'm going to be in the boat, but I'm not going to let the water of the world in the boat, right? Because I've got to go among sinners. I've got to go among people that are lost in order to reach them. And so, but I've decided I'm going to set myself apart for you. And so this is really what God is doing in Moses. Understand, Moses now has to be taken to a higher place. God has got Moses consecrated to himself. God has got Moses not thinking about the things of Egypt. We would say the things of the world. I mean, you can't get HBO in the desert. You can't get CNN, Camel News Network. You can't get that out in the desert. All he has is his Bible, time in prayer, and the Lord. That's all he's got. And so God has him where he's supposed to be. And again, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong in watching news. or That's not my point. My point is, is God has Moses right where he wants for the great work that he's called Moses to do. And now he's trying to draw Moses in closer. And we saw last week, remember, God began to reveal himself there. We saw it when he was feeding the flocks. God began to draw him in. And tonight we're going to see God's call as he moves Moses in. Let's just for scripture's sake, go ahead and read the first three verses again. So we see this. Watch God now begin to put this call and draw Moses in. Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, it says, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Now, this is going to be an important mountain in Moses' life. He didn't know this yet. But God is going to bring Moses back to this mountain. It's kind of neat that God had Moses out in that area leading the flocks because now he's going to take people the flocks of God and lead them in that same area. And Moses would need to know that area in order to be able to do that. And it all starts here at this mountain of God. And and the angel of the Lord, remember we said last week, this is Jesus Christ. It's what theologians call a theophany or a Christophany, a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ before he came to live as a man. The Bible refers to him when he does that as the angel of the Lord. It means the messenger of the Lord. So the messenger of the Lord appeared to him, Jesus Christ, in a flame of fire from the midst of the bush. And he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. So now he gets Moses' attention. Something supernatural happens in Moses' life. You ever had those supernatural moments where you know what? This is God. This is God. God right now is moving right now. You ever had those? That's like a a mini burning bush for you. It's happening right then. God is getting your attention. Whoa, Lord, there you are. There's the flame of your spirit, and God begins to draw you in. This is what's happening to Moses, except that it's in a a much more dramatic way. So notice what Moses does, and this is the, the best response. Moses said, I will now turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. It was it was burning, but it wasn't being burned up. And notice whenever God tries to reveal himself to us in a greater way, it should always draw us in. Always. But does it always do that? Not always. Some run away when they hear the voice of God. Some run away when they see the power of God. Now I'm going to pick on uh, Moses a little bit later on, but remember when God was going to do the miracle with Moses' staff. He said, Moses, put your staff down. And God did a supernatural miracle that probably would have freaked any of us out unless you were expecting it and already knew God's power. All of a sudden the staff turns into a snake, right? Now, if you're women, you'd run anyway. I understand that. But for a man, you're kind of like, you know, there's a snake all of a sudden, you're stick, and he takes off running. And I think a lot of times, you know, when God reveals himself to us, as an unbeliever, when God first began to show himself, God did miracles in my, God gave me these burning bushes in my life. I've I've shared some of these with you guys in the past. I mean, things where I I remember being in this house one time and saying, all right, God, if you're real, then I need a place to live. Have somebody knock on the door right now and give me a place to live. And I'm just kind of, you know, seeing what really happened. And I hear This really happened to me. I wasn't saved yet. I go to the door. There's a guy outside the door. He offers me a place to live in his house, a room to stay in. He left his car downtown because he'd been partying. He was knocking on the door because a friend of his lived there, but his friend was gone, and I was there because I was staying temporarily with that friend. 
And he said, hey, can you give me a ride down to get my car? And I said, sure, and hopped in. I'm thinking, this, could this be it, Lord? And all of a sudden, out of the blue, he says to me, and I didn't say I needed a place to live. I didn't tell him that. Because I wanted God to do it. If it's really God, he's really real, and this world, then he's going to, and he says to me, hey, I've got a room to rent. Do you need a place to live? Now, what kind of question is that? How many people just out of the blue say, excuse me, what's your name? Yeah, hey, do you need a place to live? I've got a room to rent. Now, I've, I've got story after story like that I could share with you, but the bottom line is these are these burning bush experiences that God gives us to draw us in. Now, for me, you know what it did? It pushed me away because I didn't want to give up yet. I thought if I do this, then I have to give up all the things that I want to do, and I'm going to have to quit this and quit that. And It's that whole thing where Satan begins to tell you you're going to miss out if you come to God, and I ran for two more years after that. Isn't that pathetic? It's pathetic. But see, this also happens to believers, guys. Note this. God wanted to show the supernatural to Moses, and he said, put your rod down. He put his rod down, it turned into a snake. What did Moses do when God showed him the supernatural? He ran. And how many of us today, when the gifts of the Spirit begin to manifest, somebody speaks in tongues, or there's a word of prophecy that comes forward, or whatever, what, what's, the t- what's the inclination of us? Are we drawn closer to God by that burning bush experience, seeing the supernatural, or do we do like Moses and take off running, going, ah, what do we do? I've seen the abuses. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when it's done in the power of the Lord the right way. And we need to make sure that we're not running from the supernatural and the things that God wants to show us because we could say, yeah, we ran for a while as an unbeliever, but are we running as believers? God has a lot he wants to show us, gang. He wants to draw us in. And the gifts of the Spirit are a part of that. Everything that God has to offer is a part of that. And so we have to make sure that You know, we're listening to it. Now, Moses sees this, and he sees God's glory. Now, look, Moses is drawn in. Notice this. So when he turns to see why the bush is not burning. So when the Lord saw, note this. I have this underline. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look. In other words, it's as if to say God was waiting to see. Are you going to run, Moses? Are you going to ignore it, Moses? What are you going to do? Are you going to do like Mark did for two years when I had somebody come to his door when he asked me that thing and I showed him a miracle? Are you going to do like, uh, like you're going to do later when I turn the serpent into so you shoot supernatural power and you take off running? What are you going to do, Moses? But when God saw that Moses said, you know what? I'm not afraid. I see your power and I want to know it more. I want to understand it more and I want more of it in my life. More love, more power, more of you in my life. We sang it tonight. And so now when God sees that, what does God do? God is now going to respond, and God is going to meet Moses right where he is and show him greater things than he ever dreamed or imagined. And if we will respond to the move of the Spirit as God draws us in, guys, God will show us greater things than we've ever dreamed or imagined. God's faithful to do it. So when the Lord saw that Moses turned aside, notice that the Lord revealed himself. Do you want more? Are you going to ignore it? And again, you you think, well, how could he ignore it? He's going to have to look at it some. Yeah, but he could have looked at it some and it freaked him out and he left. But this is interesting because God wanted to see if Moses would draw closer when God began to show him the supernatural. And I'm not saying that God was playing hard to get. God wants everyone to know him and to have this kind of relationship. I'm simply saying that God never forces himself on anyone. And when God shows us something supernatural, he waits on us to respond. What's our response going to be? And sometimes, you know, when the Lord reveals himself, it's just to see what we're going to do, how we'll respond to that. Because you know what? There's times, these always puzzle me. There are times in the Bible when it says that the Lord did something supernatural and it says, and he would have gone on. Remember when he walked on water? When you read all four of the gospels, I forget which gospel it's in, but in one of the gospels it says, and the Lord was walking on water and would have passed by. He would have gone on. He wasn't even going to go to the boat. He was going to let them row on in on their own. He was just going to walk on over to land and wait on them. And it says the Lord would have walked by, but they cried out to him. Note that. When they saw the supernatural, they cried out. And until they cried out in the midst of seeing the supernatural, he would have gone on by. I think a lot of people, especially, I think the best modern day application I've already made, and that is the gifts of the Spirit. People, when God tries to show those kind of things, we as believers oftentimes don't want to cry out to the Lord to show us more. We want to get out of there. And we have to say, God, I want everything you have for me. They cried out. Remember the two guys on the mass road? They're walking down a mass road, and it says this guy came up to him. Well, we know the guy was God. It was the Lord. It was Jesus. And he talked to him. They didn't know that yet. And when they got to a mass, it says, and the Lord would have gone on. He was leaving until they said, please stay. Please stay. So it's kind of this thing where it's almost like this kind of thing where God says, look, I'm going to show you just enough to get you interested. But if you don't ask me to come closer, if you don't ask me to to draw in and draw you in, then I'm going to go on. I'm not talking about leaving us and not wanting us to be saved and not wanting a relationship. I'm talking about that intimacy and power and being close to the Lord. And so 
God reveals himself in some new form or some new fashion. He expects us to respond appropriately. And if we don't respond appropriately, God moves on. I had somebody say to me one time, you know, I think God gave me a gift of tongues years ago. And I started using that gift. And all of a sudden somebody told me, well, hey, those aren't for today. And like I couldn't find it anywhere in the Bible that it wasn't for today. But they were older Christian and said it wasn't for today. So I just quit doing it. And you know what? It just kind of died in my life. I think God moved on. I think God says, you know what? If you're not going to allow me to move in power, why would I move in power? You want me to operate in the gifts of the Spirit? Then be open to the gifts of the Spirit and let me do it or else I'm going to move on. Not that you're not saved, not that he doesn't love you, but just like the guys on the man's road, he would have gone on, just like walking on the water, he would have gone on. But they called out to him and he stopped and he ministered. So when he turned, he saw, notice God called him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. So you can imagine, think about Moses walking up to the burning bush going, what is that thing kind of creeping up slowly? And all of a sudden this voice comes to him, hey, Moses, you know, this burning bush knows me, you know? <laughs> Where have we met? Who are you? What are you doing, you know? And so he calls out in this personal thing to Moses here. I mean, this is kind of freaky, really, when you think about it. And notice what he says to him. This is the thing that, that is interesting. Notice after he says, here I am. He said to him, do not draw near this place. Now, wouldn't God want Moses to draw near? Doesn't God want us to draw near? Well, the answer is obviously yes. It wasn't that God was going to stop there and say, don't draw near. God had requirements for drawing near. And notice what he says here. Do not draw near this place. Here's the requirement. Take your sandals off your feet. For the place where you stand is holy ground. Now, this is where I said last week during the worship time, God spoke to me and told me what this meant. I've never known in 20 some years of being a Christian. I've always wondered, God, what does this mean? What, what is it? Why did he have to take his sandals? What is the point? I never understand that. When you hear every, you know, I, just, I never understood why he needed to take his sandals off. And I believe God spoke to my heart and told me. But again, in here it doesn't even tell us why he took his sandals off that made him holy. But it does tell us that before he could approach God and come near to God, he had to take off his sandal. Now think about this, guys. There must be more than just taking your shoes off that makes you holy. There's some spiritual meaning to this. It wasn't just take your shoes off. It's something that God was trying to give Moses a picture of. Moses, there is a requirement I have of you. If you're going to draw near to me, there's a requirement of what you have to do to be closer. You've got to take your shoes off to draw close to me. And I thought the removing of his shoes, it wasn't the removing of Moses' shoes. I believe what God spoke to my heart last week, it was what was on Moses' shoes, the dirt of the world. And before Moses could approach the Lord, he had to remove the dirt of the world from his body so God could allow him to draw in close. Now, I know these are literal sandals and this was literal dirt and there's probably nothing sinful in the dirt on the bottom of his sandals, but there was a spiritual picture, I believe, that God was giving Moses right here. And there's a spiritual picture, I believe, that God is giving us and that is this. If we are gonna draw close to God, we have to remove the filth and the dirt of the world before we get to him or we can't draw close. He just won't let it happen. He's a holy God. We can't be living in unrighteousness and unholiness and expect to have an intimate relationship. It doesn't work that way. We've got to take our sandals off. It's like saying, God, you know what? Whatever the filth in the world that I've got, I don't want it anymore. I want you. I want to do whatever I have to do to get rid of it and to be able to draw close to you. The same thing is true for us, guys. If we want to draw close to God, we have to take off our shoes. And the question is tonight, what is the dirt that you're carrying around right now? What is it? Do you have filth from the world that you're carrying that everywhere you go, it goes with you, you're walking with it? Is it a part of you? You've got to take it off. See, God will show himself to you in a powerful way, but God says, I can't have communion with that. Light and darkness can't hang out together. And just like that, another time at the table of God's Word has come to an end. Maybe you've heard these things mentioned in the book of Exodus before, or perhaps you're hearing it for the first time. Exodus is one of those books where it's undeniable, observing God's power and might in what He does through His people and for His people. Pastor Mark will continue teaching through the book of Exodus next time, but you don't have to wait until then to listen to more great Bible studies. You can access this series, plus much more, at thewaymedia.net. Feel free to share these messages with anyone who wants to know more about what the Bible has to say. You can also download the Way Media app to access teachings as they're available. Before we close, we want you to know that if you live in the Knoxville area, you're invited to join Pastor Mark in the community of Jesus followers at Calvary Knoxville for our next service. For over 20 years, it's been incredible to see how God has used us in our local community. And through this radio outreach, there's always a seat for you. Sunday mornings at 8, 9.30, or 11.15. 
We also meet on Sunday nights at 6 or Wednesday nights at 7. If you can't make it in person, that's not a problem. You can join us online. We're streaming our services through the Way Media app. To find more info on Calvary Knoxville, scroll to the bottom of the WayMedia.net for a link to our church website. Pastor Mark has more to share from the book of Exodus, so be sure to join us the next time we come to the table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.